I want to give a shout out uh, before I really start rolling into 30 by 30 because when we first jumped on 30 by 30 and we did an event in Valentine, Nebraska, uh, I think about two days later, Shad called me and he said, okay, RCAF needs to know about this. <laughs> so you guys, because of Shad, was really the first agriculture organization in the nation to start getting active on 30 by 30. So you guys deserve a round of applause for that. Do we have the, oh good, okay. All right, so I'm gonna start, I'm gonna give you a little bit of background about me um, and our organization so that I live in Texas, and yes, I'm city-fied, I live in a city now, but I did grow up on a ranch, so just to redeem myself a little bit. Uh, I was raised on cow-calf operation in central Nevada. Um, probably a lot of you have heard a little bit about our story. My parents are Wayne and Jean Hage and we filed the first ever federal land grazing take, takings case in the country. So we did that back in 1991. And so basically I grew up on the back of a horse and grew up fighting the federal agencies um, for a very long time uh, as we pursued that case. And you know, I don't know how many in here are, are, you guys are probably split, some that deal with federal land operations and some that deal with primarily private land operations. But I want to tell you a little bit of a story of kind of some of the things that happened to us on the operation. So on Pine Creek Ranch, it's 1,100 square miles. Part of that's private, part of that's federal, grazing allotments. We're dealing with the, the Forest Service and the BLM all the time. They are your business partners. <laughs> and so um, when we first purchased the ranch, uh, the previous owners were, were, got out, really, and they were very upfront about it because the regulatory pressures were so bad in 1978. And so to give you an idea, our first grazing season there, 105 day grazing season, and one of the mountains that we ran on was Table Mountain, elevation 12,000 feet, and um, has its wilderness, so three trails up, three, actually four trails down, but the Forest Service didn't know about the fourth. And, and so it's, it's a big rugged op uh, operation an average ride for us was about 25 miles a day horseback. So in this 105 day grazing season, uh, we, re we received 70 visits and 40 certified letters from the Forest Service, complaining about allegations, things that we were doing wrong, how we were violating our grazing permit. And let, me, let me give you an example of one of those times. They said that we were not maintaining our drift fences on Table Mountain. So, to get up to Table Mountain, it's a day's ride up, a day's ride across the top, about 25 miles, and a day's ride back down. It's wilderness, so you have to pack up all your fencing equipment, from fence posts to wires, everything. And they didn't tell us what the problem was, they just said that we had a problem. So Dad sends a guy up, and he rides it all, he comes back down three days later, and, uh, and hands Dad a, a little blue flag that they had tagged it with, and Dad said, so what was the problem? And he said, there was one staple missing. That was our violation. So what they were doing was using the regulations to run us out of business. And we fought them for 13 years, went through three administrative appeals cases. And in 1991, Dad and Mom finally, out of business really, um, decided we're not gonna go to federal district court and fight this. We're gonna go to the claims court and we're gonna make the case and find out what do we own, did the government take it, and how much do they owe us? And that was the very simple approach. Dad was pretty adamant that we were gonna stay out of federal district court and we were gonna solve the question of what did the Western Rancher own or not. So we filed the case in 1991 and that is when we started the organization Stewards of the Range, which is now American Stewards of Liberty which is run by myself and my husband, Dan Byfield. And um, we went through, we won the first rounds. We actually were, were awarded $14.4 million for the taking of our water that flowed to, the feder to our private lands, the range improvements, and the ditch rights of way. That was appealed uh, to the DC Circuit. It was overturned by the DC Circuit on technical issues, question of standing and ripeness they completely avoided the property rights question. But 
three Eastern judges in Washington, D.C., and when in your 30 minutes of arguments, the one judge says, so what are those big dirt moving things you guys use out west? And our attorney says, caterpillar? Yeah, those things. You pretty much know you're not going to get a good ruling, right? So, uh, and then the Supreme Court refused to hear the case. So that really ended 27 years of litigation on the takings case. 13 years of the harassment, 27 years in court. I tell you that story because it's one of the reasons why I think, well, first off, it's the heart behind our organization, American Stewards of Liberty. Okay, see now, I still need to know how to run this. There we go. <laughs> it might take me a while. Um, but we are a private property rights organization and we really believe property rights are one of the most important rights that we have. They protect every other liberty. And that's one of the reasons why you guys are so important, because you are America's landowners. And you are the ones on the ground defending our property rights. And we definitely need you now. Let's talk about 30 by 30. So 30 by 30 is, to, in a nutshell, a very radical agenda to permanently protect 30% of our lands and oceans in their natural state by 2030. That's the agenda. Now, right before President Biden was elected, we really started, I started seeing 30 by 30 come up in some of the literature that we were watching, uh, the environmental literature. And when he was elected, that became one of the things that we really started drilling into. Um, we were just seeing it come up, and we thought we better, be, we better take a look at this and see what they're talking about because we really expected the Biden administration to put forward very radical ideas. And so as we started looking into 30 by 30, one of the first things that we discovered is that there was a Senate resolution and a House resolution filed last session. And and, and it was for 30 by 30, this concept that we're going to talk about today. Now, it wasn't very popular. On the Senate, there were only 10 senators that co-signed this resolution. It was only a resolution, not a bill. And um, on the House side, there were only five members. But what caught our attention was that this, the signers of these, for the Senate version, was then Senator Harris, now our Vice President, and then Representative Holland, now our Secretary of Interior. So when we saw their names on this, we thought, <laughs> here comes 30 by 30. We're going to be dealing with this. So we really started studying it. And what we found is in the environmental literature, everything teed back to this report put out by the Center for American Progress. And it's a report called, How Much Nature Should America Keep? And this is the thing. If you really want to understand what 30 by 30 is, this is the report to read. And pretty much everything we saw from the environmental groups would cite this report. Now, who's the Center for American Progress? It's an organization started by George Soros. It's funded by Bloomberg. Tom Daschle is one of the board members. It's a very progressive left organization, and they'll tell you that. Interesting th th about this, too, is the executive director of this was nominated to be our Office of Management and Bud Budget Chair, one of the most important policy positions in the White House. But you know what? She's one of the only nominees that Biden has had pull because she was so radical. Now think about that. We have a BLM uh, director nominated right now who was involved with an eco-terrorist group and tree spiking, and Biden won't pull that but he had to pull this lady's nomination because she was so radical. But he didn't put her in a Senate cons confirmed position. He put her in her top policy position, so she's in the White House now. She's still there. So let's talk about the CAP report. What is it? What you guys really need to understand is the environmental perspective. What is it that they're trying to achieve with 30 by 30 and why? So here's what you learn in the CAP report. They claim that over one million species will go extinct in the coming decades 
including one third of America's species, unless we permanently protect 30% of our land. They say we're losing a football field of habitat to development every 30 seconds. They say two thirds of that development is on private lands. See, that's a problem because only 1% of that land is permanently protected. Only 12% of the total land in the U.S. is per permanently protected in the man manner that they are seeking for 30%. And the lands that must be preserved, what's the goal? Are the lands that include the high biodiversity and productivity. So after we really dug into this, the day after the inauguration, we were pretty convinced we're going to see 30 by 30 at some point this year. So in our news report, Liberty Matters, we put out a story, remember cattle free by 93, here comes 30 by 30. And we wanted to start getting people, get 30 by 30 in front of our audience um, so that as it came up, th that we could jump on top of this. Well, what we didn't realize is it would only be six days later that it shows up in the Climate Crisis Executive Order, 14008. But it wasn't picked up by many people because it's in a 57-page executive order. There's so many bad things in this executive order. This is where they shut down oil and gas and all these other things. And also because the way that it's phrased in here is kind of easy to miss. Section 216, it's about page 9, and it says, that the Climate Task Force or the departments will submit a report to the Climate Task Force in 90 days to achieve the goal of conserving at least 30% of our lands and water by 2030. Now, if you weren't already familiar with 30 by 30, you'd probably think, oh, that doesn't sound too bad, or it really wouldn't catch your attention. It caught ours because we knew what 30 by 30 was. But confirmation for this was on the very same day the Department of Interior released a report, a fact sheet, explaining the climate crisis uh, executive order and how they'd be implementing their part of it. And in this, they talk about 30 by 30. And here's what they say. Approximately 60% of the land in the continental U.S. Uh, United States, but we are losing a football field worth every 30 seconds. Where did you hear that? We're going to lose a million species, including one-third species in the coming decades in the U.S. That only 12% of the lands are currently permanently protected. All of this is, a, is pretty much a cut and paste out of the CAP report. So when we saw this come out at the same time as the executive order, we knew exactly what we were dealing with. We were dealing with 30 by 30. So we got busy, and one of the first things we did was we reached out to a county in Colorado that we've worked a lot with over the years. They have a great board of commissioners and staff, and in one phone call explained what we were dealing with by 30 by 30, and Tom Jankowski, the commissioner, and Fred Jarman, the deputy manager, said, get us, an get us a, a resolution and we'll get it passed. And so we worked with an attorney that we work a lot with uh, in Arizona, Norm James, and he drafted the first, executive, the first resolution to oppose 30 by 30, and uh, Garfield County adopted that. So that was the first thing we did. And one of the reasons that we took this step is one of the other things that the environmentalists had done in 2020, they had circulated in Congress a letter the League of Conservation Voters had circulated a letter in Congress uh, advocating for 30 by 30 signed by 450 local elected officials. That was 2020. So they were way ahead of us. However, as I scan through this, look, this list of local elected officials, well, a supervisor out of LA, of course they're gonna go for this. A mayor in, in Boise, Idaho, of course she's gonna go for this. They weren't getting names from rural America, the land that was the target. So that's the reason why we felt it was really important that we get local government resolutions opposing this, because that's not one local elected official who has no power on their own. When a board makes that decision that has planning authority, it means something. 
And so that's the reason that we thought the first thing we've got to do is blanket the nation in opposition with local government resolutions. So that's why we started that. Let's see, did I miss something? No, we got it. Okay. All right, let's break this down. So we know from the Department of Interior fact sheet, there's some things that they're talking about. Let's break it down. First off, what is the 12% that they're saying is, is already permanently protected? This comes from the USGS, Geological Service. The 12% that's currently protected, national parks, wilderness areas, permanent conservation easements on private land. Now, that should worry all of you about conservation easements in perpetuity. If they think that that protects the land as much as a wilderness area or a national park, that's concerning. State parks, national wildlife refuges, national monuments, and other protected areas. That's the 12% that they're talking about that is currently permanently protected in the manner they want to see 30%. All right, how much is 30%? There's a couple of different figures because we have two different uh, government agencies with different figures on how much land is in the U.S. I know that's hard to imagine, right? <laughs> but they, there is. BLM has one figure. Congressional Research Service has another figure. We're using the Congressional Research Service number of 2.27 billion acres. So 30% is 681 million acres. 12% of that, what's already permanently preserved, is 270 million acres. So we're talking of the gap about 400 million acres that they're trying to permanently protect in, in now eight and a half years. And one of the questions that comes up is a lot of people when this first came out said, oh, well, they're just talking about the federal lands in the West. That's what they'll consider the 30% preserved. You know, us in the private land states, we don't really have to worry about this. Well, they're saying 12% is permanently protected. 28% of the nation is already owned by the federal government. They're not talking about the, the federal lands that we already have. They're talking about the level of protection on all the lands, private and federal. And this is the part that I really like. Norm James, the attorney that I, I, t I told you about, he crunched the numbers. This is the 30 by 30 crisis map. Now remember they told us we're losing a football field to development every 30 seconds. Okay, that's 3,000 acres a day. That's 1.1 million acres a year. So in 10 years, that's 11 million acres. That doesn't add up. Why are they trying to take 681 million acres? If the damage is 11 million acres. This is why we call it a land grab. This is a land grab. Now, National Geographic has been one of the, the real proponents of 30 by 30, and they have been doing articles on this for actually, so I think this article might come at, have been a 2019 article. If you guys can see the outline of the US, the little block is what 12% looks like, the big block is what 30% looks like. Or as Governor Ricketts says, it's basically one state of Nebraska every year for the next nine years. That's a lot of land. Now all through the material, you can go from the very beginning, the CAP report, the Senate House resolution, everything that, that um, has come out on this, except from the real radical environmental groups, there's always language in there talking about how they're gonna work with us. And it's in the executive order. The Biden administration says, we will work to achieve the 30 by 30 goal by supporting local, state, private, and tribally led nature conservation and restoration efforts that are underway across America. So remember, they want you to believe that this is locally driven, that you're voluntarily going to give up your property rights to enroll in these programs, and that they're just here to help you. I know that I, I, I have said this many time and times in, in friendly audiences. I think I can say this now to hear. Does anybody really believe Biden came up with this? <laughs> I know you guys didn't come up with this. Okay. 
So that's the rhetoric. What they want us to believe is that they're just trying to help conserve land and help farmers and ranchers do a better job at that, make it easier for you guys to do that. That's what 30 by 30 is all about. That's the PR, that's what they want you guys to believe. That's fine, we'll read the rhetoric, but you always watch the actions. What are they doing? And this is important. So the executive order was signed January 27th. February 11th, the acting secretary of the Department of Interior overturned a key policy by the Trump administration. Now, when new administrations come in, they overturn policies all the time, so there's nothing new about that. What is unprecedented is that this was done by the acting secretary and they didn't wait for the Senate confirmed secretary to start clearing the hurdles. This one in particular is important, Secretary of the Order 3396. Now, last session, there was a bill passed, the Great American Outdoors Act. And in that, it permanently and fully funded the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which is the fund that allows the federal government to acquire private lands, it's, it, to, to make federal land acquisitions in part. That's part of what that, that money is for. So when that bill was passed, Congress gave the Secretary of the Interior a uh, wide latitude to develop policy on how that would be carried out. Secretary Bernhardt in the Trump administration wrote a policy Secretary Order 3388, which required before any federal land acquisitions took place, they had to have the consent of the states and counties. So a county could say, we don't want this. We want to keep our land private. And they would have to honor that. That's what Secretary Order 3388 did. This order by the Biden administration on February 11th overturned that and cleared that hurdle. So remember, they're just here to work with you. <laughs> but they take away one of the key defenses we had to fight this. We read a publication, it's Energy and Environment News. It's an environmental uh, publication. Um, it's one of the few out there that actually is pretty accurate. Um, they, uh, they did a story on us not too long ago, which, you know, we'll give it a pass. <laughs> <laughs> on accuracy, but um, this is a really good publication because it's, it's, it, they really are, they really will give you the inside ball on what the environmentalists are thinking. And the day that that order was put out, uh, they came out with a story on it, and it was titled Biden Dumps Trump's LWC Changes Rece Revives Urban Grants. And in the discussion on why they needed to get rid of that provision, that allowed states and local governments to veto, essentially veto, a federal land acquisition. They say, critics said that this move would have prevented conservation efforts in states where more conservative leaders are sensitive about losing too much private land. That's what they think about private land. Okay, the next thing that happened that I think is really important there was a bill that went through Congress. It was rushed through in four days. It's a huge land grab. Here's what it does. Creates 1.5 million acres of new wilderness, withdraws 1.2 million acres from mineral production. This is an area around the Grand Canyon, which has our rare earth minerals. So we're importing those minerals right now at 80 to 90% from China and Europe. This permanently withdraws our ability to mine our own rare earths, minerals. Designates 1,200 miles of new wild and scenic rivers, expands 1,100,000 acres of national monument lands, and adds 400,000 acres of recreation, conservation, and special management areas. What's important for you guys to know is when this bill was going through, the White House endorsed it and said this needed to pass in order to help them achieve 30 by 30. And that was back when they were still calling this 30 by 30. They've, they've rebranded it, we'll get to that. But here's what's important. This is a natural resource bill. So normally, you would put it through the Natural Resource Committee, which has the jurisdiction to hear this. They put it through the Rules Committee, which is a 12 to four advantage, Democrat to Republican. Voted it out of committee and it passed on the House floor in four days. This is still sitting in the Senate. It hasn't moved, but we absolutely have to keep our eye on this. 
So this is what the Biden administration early on signaled to us. This is what they intend with 30 by 30. This is what they're trying to achieve. Now, another thing that I think is really important uh, for everybody to pay attention to and to understand who the opposition is on this, um, who we're fighting on this. Representative DeGatt is the, is the sponsor of that bill. Her district is a little black district in Colorado. It's Denver. Half a million of the acres that she put in the bill to put into wilderness, it's a bill she's had ever since she's been a representative, which I think is close to 20 years. Shad probably knows how many years she's been, been back there. Half a million of those acres are in the upper part of the pink area. What you guys need to understand is the people who are calling for the conservation of 30% of our lands and oceans have no skin in the game. They're not talking about preserving their land. They're talking about permanently protecting yours. That's who we're fighting. All right, so the first thing that we did was we got the, the resolution passed, uh, or I, we didn't get it passed, we got it written. Garfield County passed the resolution, uh, a first resolution opposing 30 by 30 in the nation. That very same day, that was February 16th, we uploaded this report that we put together, this guide for people just like you, the very first version of it, made it free and downloadable, and started it spread, spreading it so we could get as many people as possible educated quickly. We were very thankful. There were two key, key people that this got into their hands very quickly. The one was Representative Obert, who is Garfield County's representative. You, do, you, do you know who I'm talking about, Lauren Bobert? When she was elected, she's the one who said, I'm going to take my six-shooter back to D.C. You remember her? She is great. And, you know, she's very well respected back there. She really has the respect of her colleagues. She's doing a fantastic job. Well, this got to her. She immediately started spreading it back in D.C. And uh, the result of that is very quickly we got a couple letters out of uh, Congress opposing 30 by 30 and asking questions of the White House. Between the two letters, I think we had a, a, common, a total of 70 representatives and senators sign this and say, we oppose this, and we need answers on what you're trying to do. That was very good. The other thing that was so important that happened is it got to Governor Ricketts in Nebraska very quickly. And we did our first meeting kind of like this in Valentine, Nebraska, at the, at the first part of March. Before I even got into the state, he had come out with a statement opposing 30 by 30. And after we did the Valentine event, which I was told to expect 50 people, <laughs> and I think we ended up with, uh, I've heard everywhere from 350 to 400 people at that little meeting on 30 by 30. And that's where Chad got the message uh, of what was, what was going on on this program. Next day, w was able to meet with Governor Ricketts, and he is just a great, great leader. I was so, so blessed to, we all are very fortunate to have him on our side on this. And Governor Ricketts then uh, started educating the other states, his, gov his colleagues, the other governors, and was able to get a letter signed by 15 governors opposing 30 by 30 and sending about two pages of questions to the White House on what 30 by 30 was. It was really key opposition to get right out of the gates. And Governor Ricketts calls it a land grab because it's a land grab. <laughs> and that's what's been really interesting. So when we started in this, you could read everything in the environmental literature and it would tell you this is 30 by 30 and we are permanently protecting 30% of the lands and oceans. Well, the ground game that we put in place, the government, local government resolutions that were starting to get passed across the country, the leaders that were stepping up and opposing this, kind of changed the dynamics. And by April, Secretary Vilsack, as he was coming out and trying to sell the conservation Rever reserve programs and all of the and conservation easements in perpetuity and how they were really going to help landowners, you know, do more with their land uh, through these programs, he was getting all these questions on 30 by 30, and so he was having to start defend uh, the 30 by 30 program. And what I love about this is that as he tries to explain that, no, 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 this isn't a land grab, he has to say this is a land grab. 
So <laughs> I love it. I could assure you this. There's no intention to have a land grab. Vilsack told reporters, there's no intention to take something away from people. But they've been on the defensive ever since. And um, that's been really important. It's been really important that the grassroots started opposing this immediately. All right, I want to drill down into the CAP report a little bit deeper because there's two concepts in here that I think you guys really need to understand. This is the report that we looked at at the very beginning. The first and the question that we've had, is private land going to be targeted? And the answer to that is absolutely. It's a key target because they say 60% of the land is privately owned, but only 1% of that land is permanently protected. But three quarters of the habitat con conversion is happening on private lands. So that's the problem. So private property is absolutely on the menu. The other thing I want you to take note here, the very last sentence, the United States will not reach a 30 by 30 goal unless policymakers do more to help farmers, ranchers, fishermen, and other private landowners conserve lands, waters, and wildlife. What they're conceding is they cannot do this unless landowners voluntarily enroll in these programs. And this has been our argument. This has been my trouble with uh, some of the other national associations that have kind of been sitting on the fence and taking the position that because they say that they're going to protect property rights and respect property rights and that they're just going to work with us, you know, we want to be at the negotiating table. Well, here's the problem. What is the other side giving up? Nothing. We hold all the cards. So why are we considering negotiating on this? It's not up to other associations or the president to decide that we get to keep our property rights. That's already been decided. That's in the Constitution. That's, that's a, that's a no-brainer. So that's one of the things that really frustrates me with people that take that position. We've got to kind of wait and see what, is, what the Biden administration is going to do. And I've said this many times. You have to be very discerning of the times you live in. And this is not a time for Chamberlain. This is a time for Churchill. And we all need to recognize that. One of the other things that is really important, and I understand Harriet talked about this a little earlier, which is great, 30 by 30 is the first bite. These people believe in a philosophy. It's called the half-earth philosophy. And they believe in order to save the human race, from this climate crisis, we have to conserve half the Earth. And we say by 2050, because it's all a marketing campaign anyway, right? <laughs> so we figure we'll hear about uh, half Earth 50 by 50 eventually. So that's, that's the key goal. Now I'm going to have, I want you guys to listen to this, this report. One of the other really great things that happened early on was uh, Fox News actually reached out. And uh, I got a call from this reporter, uh, Douglas Kennedy, and he said, I'm, I'm hearing about this 30 by 30. I'm going to pitch the story. Can you uh, give me anything that will help us understand it? And so I sent him the guide that you guys have. And um, I was actually here in Rapid City in the airport when I had the conversation with him. And he said, I'm going to have questions. And I said, OK, I'll call you from the next stop. So I get to the next stop, and uh, he said, he said, now I've already pitched the story, had everything I need. We'll see if they'd run a story. Well, they did. And what is really important about this, first off, the title of the story is great. Uh, Critics call Biden's con conservation plan a land grab. I think that's a great title. The other thing that I really want you guys to hear, because to me it's kind of chilling, the National Geographic environmentalists that they interview on this Listen to what he says, because these guys are true believers. Critics are sounding the alarm on President Biden's plan to conserve 30 percent of U.S. land and water by 2030. And while the details have not been released yet, opponents are calling the plan nothing more than a land grab. Douglas Kennedy has more on this story for us. Good morning, Douglas. Yeah, Dana, as you mentioned, there are very few details on how 30 by 30 would work, and that's leaving at least one fisherman in Georgia 
with more questions than answers. And you, you don't mind chasing them anywhere? No, man, I, I love them back in here. With his Yamaha F-250, charter fisherman Greg Hildreth. They're so fun. Feels he can catch schools of tarpon everywhere on Georgia's coastline. So you don't fear finding the fish, you, you fear government regulation keep keeping you from fishing in the future. Exactly. I'm worried about my kids. I'm worried about everybody's kids. Hildreth has been fishing these waters for 30 years, but he's now worried about an executive order signed by President Biden in January. It's called 30 by 30, and it mandates protecting 30 percent of America's waterways and 30 percent of her land by the year 2030. The problem for some is it's not quite clear exactly what protection means. So the question everybody's asking is, are they protecting the ocean for you or are they protecting it from you? Exactly. That is the $100 million question. We are taking so many fish out of the ocean. Enric Sala is from National Geographic, one of many environmental groups pushing 30 by 30 to states and local governments. We need half of the planet in its natural state. So we can start by protecting at least 30 percent of our land and 30 percent of our ocean by 2030. And it's that acquisition of huge swaths of land that has property rights advocates also worried. Margaret Byfield heads American Stewards of Liberty, one of the main opponents of 30 by 30. We're looking at a huge land grab that um, is going to fundamentally change land ownership in America. So your opponents say taking this much land will fundamentally change land ownership in the United States. What do you say? We're talking about the future of humanity, and everybody has a role to play. Hildreth says he's glad to play a role as long as he and other sport fishermen aren't excluded from the dialogue or the water. So to you, the best people to protect the ocean are, are people who actually use it. Exactly. The, we are the stewards of it. And stewards, he says, should be consulted if there are going to be big changes on how the ocean is used. That's it from here. Back to you, Dana and Bill. Fascinating topic, and I appreciate your efforts. And it was beautifully, beautifully shot as well. Thank you. Thank you. So that's kind of chilling. These environmentalists really believe this and that's who we're fighting. So I just want you guys to keep that in mind as you hear the Biden administration tell you that they're just here to help you. This is the agenda they're putting in place. And the White House, the Department of Interior in particular, are staffed with true believers behind this agenda. And here's a pretty good example. The day after the president released his report on 30 by 30, which we're going to talk about here in a second. The Secretary of Commer Commerce, Gina Romano, did a press conference. And in it she said, 30% isn't the end. And 30% uh, is the beginning. It's a setting, a very strong foundation, and we hope it will build the momentum for longer term conservation to benefit current and future generations. These people are all in our administration. Now, one of the other things that we found when we were really digging into uh, 30 by 30 early on before it came up was there's a climate crisis committee in both the House and the Senate. And they produced a report in June of 2020 on tackling the climate, climate crisis. And they have pages of policy recommendations implementing 30 by 30. That's June of 2020. Congress is already keyed up. There's things in here like put as much money as you can into conservation easements into per perpetuity, get landowners to enroll their land in those programs. There's discussion of getting rid of the archaic uh, federal land management laws like the Taylor Grazing Act, I'm, I'm sorry, Federal Land Policy and Management Act and the National Forest Management Act because they, those acts uh, talk about multiple use and sustained yield as opposed to protecting the climate. So these are the concepts that they already have policy kind of structured and ready to go, which is why we really have to be on our toes uh, and watch Congress. 
Now, in, in response to the letter that the House and Senate had sent over to the White House, the White House finally did do a briefing. And they gave the staffers about a 10-minute presentation and then took questions. The staffers had great substantive questions. The Biden administration had very few answers. But one of the things they did say is they were planning to use all the tools in the toolbox. So all existing tools, things that they already have in place that are authorized, they plan to use to implement 30 by 30. So what are we talking about? National and state parks, expanding those. Wilderness areas, national monuments, the Antiquities Act. They were asked specifically, will you use the Antiquities Act? That's where the president can withdraw with the stroke of a pen, federal lands, and put them in a national monument. And the staffer said, absolutely, we'll be using that. National wildlife refu refuges, expanding those. Wild and scenic rivers, more. Historic designations, scenic byways, ACECs, wilderness study areas being converted into wilderness areas. And the conservation programs and conservation easements in perpetuities. Those are the two that give them access and control to the private lands. So all those things are really important. All of these are tools that they already have in the toolbox. Nothing needs to be authorized. These are already laws that they can use. Here's the thing I want you guys to think about with the conservation programs, like CRP, the Conservation Rever Reserve Program, EQIP, some of these where they pay the landowner to uh, rest the land or set the si aside the land or put it back into grasslands for a term. And then you can, you can take it out after, after that enrollment time. What I, those are the kind of conservation pr programs that we have to be very careful about because whenever there's any funding or a program or any authorization needed on your private lands, it creates a federal nexus to those lands. So, just one example, I'm gonna talk about the Endangered Species Act. When they designate critical habitat for a species, it does not apply to private lands, unless there's a federal nexus. So if your land is in CRP, or any of the, these other conservation programs, which Secretary Vilsack is working very hard right now to get people to enroll in, that creates the federal nexus. The only thing that has to really change, because in the past it really hasn't been a, a huge issue. I mean, and I tell people, in the Trump administration, I don't know that I would have really worried about it too much because he was low regulation, high productivity. Well, now we know what the Biden administration wants. He wants to control the land. So this is the time to really rethink those contracts. If you're considering them, read them carefully. There's a Nebraska landowner that talked to Governor Ricketts, and when he looked at his, his new contract for CRP, it had some new language in there protecting the swift fox. He'd never seen a swift fox in that area. So he went to the NRCS office and asked him, what does this mean? What do I have to do? And they couldn't tell him. He was very wise, and he decided, I'm not enrolling. And that, I think, was very smart on his part. But that's the discernment you guys have to use. Be very, very careful about these contracts. And the conservation easements in perpetuity, they're a whole other animal. And I'm, I'm going to say one thing. If you guys have questions on them, I'm happy to, to help you walk through it. But people like to say that a conservation easement is a property right. The landowner has the right to do that. And I agree. But... It's a, con it's a private property right before you sign that conservation easement. Once you sign that conservation easement, you are giving control to a land trust or the federal government. They now control your land. They have the controlling uh, conservation purpose over your land. And a key component to property rights is control. If you don't control it, it's really not private property anymore. And that's in perpetuity. When you get into a conservation easement, you get a tax deduction, either income or estate. That's it. And you've sold away the most important parts of your property. And the next generation gets nothing but the restrictions. And I can talk about this a lot more, but I, I know we're gonna probably be, are we getting out on time? I, oh, I'm getting the cut signal. 
Okay. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blow through some of these things because let me show you. This is the gap analysis. The dark green areas, that's the 12% that they're talking about. Everything else on this map is what they're after. The Biden administration came out with a 30 by 30 report, and there's key things that they did. First off, they rebranded it to America the Beautiful. They're ditching the 30 by 30 name. Now we're supposed to call it America the Beautiful. It's styled as locally driven. They want you to know that everything they're talking about is locally driven. This comes from you guys, Grassroots Up. You guys thought about this. It's volunteer con conservation. And even though they say throughout we must conserve and restore the land, they can't define what they mean by conserve. It's too difficult. They'll have to work that one out. Now, I'm sure you guys don't believe that any more than we do. And they also don't identify any lands that qualify. Even though they told us in the beginning what, it, what the 12% was, now they say, oh, that's a little difficult to figure out. What has happened is they've had a lot of pushback. And so they're trying to rebrand and get rid of any substance that can be attacked and hopefully uh, get the urban public to support this program. When this came out, Governor Ricketts, I think, had the best statement on this. He said, while the report states that 30 by 30 will include voluntary private measures, at least in part, this reassurance is not enough. If the Biden administration really believed that voluntary measures worked, they would leave conservation efforts to the states and private landowners instead of pursuing a national strategy that imposes goals written by federal bureaucrats. Amen. All right, key points. There's no authority for 30 by 30. The president cannot unilaterally decide we're going to conserve 30% of the land. That is up to Congress. There's no credible science supporting 30 by 30. And the people who are, who are pushing this have no skin in the game. Here's some of the things that, that have happened that have really pushed this back. And there's a termination bill that was filed by Representative Bobert. It's something you guys really need to get your representatives to sign on to. Governor Ricketts uh, did an executive order uh, protecting Nebraskans from the federal government. He is literally standing between Nebraskans and the federal government on this. It's remarkable. The letter that was filed um, by, the con by Congress uh, prior to America the Beautiful coming out is the map on the right or on the left, on the left that has the big red. That's who, those are this, these uh, representatives that came out opposed to 30 by 30. The second map is the Termination Act. And that's the map that we're having a hard time getting our representatives to really take a stand and oppose 30 by 30. These are the governors opposed. And these are the local governments that we know of so far that have passed the resolution opposing 30 by 30. One more thing I want to point out, because this is new and this is recent. The National Climate, uh, they've created a, a work group, an interagency work group for 30 by 30. And in this, this just came out on August 10th. They're back to using the protection language. These efforts will deliver increased protection for the water, air, land, and communities that we all depend upon for the health uh, and the health of our economy. They've also changed the purpose. Remember, it was about species. Now it's about health and the health of the, the economy. All right, so what do you do? Get educated and educate your neighbors. Get your local governments to formally oppose 30 by 30. They say this is locally driven. That's going to be a real hard sell if your local governments are opposed to this. Watch for the conservation programs coming into your community. Talk to each other. Make sure you guys know what's going on and compare notes. Keep your county commissioners informed and your state if you've got good state representatives. Partner regionally. They are trying to put things in on an ecosystem-wide basis and connect nationally. And that's one thing we can help you with. Um, we are trying to keep everybody apprised of what's going on 30 by 30 uh, through our new service. And if you join, of course, you'll, you'll be kept up as well. But we, we highly encourage you guys to stay plugged into this nationally. 
There's a proverb, I think, that speaks really well to this battle. And it is, the horse is prepared for the day of battle, but deliverance is of the Lord. And I like to remind audiences of this. Sometimes when you're looking at something as big as 30 by 30, you think, how do we fight this? But we have to remember our job is to fight. And the victory will be brought by the Lord. 